In this video, we'll cover some of the ascending and descending projections of the reticular formation. The reticular formation is a collection of nuclei in the brainstem that can create some local tracts to create reflexes and then carry out some of these reflexes by either projecting upward to the thalamus and cortex or downward into the spinal cord. We'll start low and talk about projections that go downward into the spinal cord to affect respiration and blood flow. Then we'll cover some of the ascending projections that help create our sleep-wake cycles. As you might expect, the reticular formation near the top of the brainstem projects upward and the reticular formation near the bottom projects downward. So the organization makes sense. Projecting downward, we're going to take into account uh, what's the level of carbon dioxide in the blood, what's the pressure of the blood, and knowing those two things will control respiration and blood flow. Let's start off with respiration. So how do we know when it's time to take a breath? Well, the buildup of carbon dioxide is a good cue. Carbon dioxide, of course, combines with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then quickly dissociates into acid and bicarbonate. This is the bicarbonate buffer system. So as carbon dioxide levels increase, so do acid levels. And this is something that we can pick up. We have acid sensing ion channels. In this case, potassium channels. So here on the right we can see what they're calling carbon dioxide sensitive neurons or cells. Uh, and of course they're not directly sensitive to carbon dioxide, they're instead sensitive to the acid. But when they elevate carbon dioxide, shown in panel B there on the bottom. Those gray areas of elevated carbon dioxide also show an increase in firing. It causes the neurons to fire. In the bottom part there you'll see that increases in carbon dioxide cause a drop in pH. And that is picked up by pH sensitive potassium channels. Now here's the deal. A drop in pH causes them to close. And we can see that in part D there. What they're doing is showing the pH on the X, low pH, high pH on the right. So when we increase carbon dioxide, we increase acid, thus dropping our pH. So an increase in carbon dioxide is going to be over here on the left. Over here, they're showing us the conductance through that potassium channel. So our permeability to potassium, again, high to low. And what we see is this kind of curve here. If we increase carbon dioxide, that drops the pH, and in doing so, decreases potassium conductance. If we're less permeable to potassium, we move away from its reversal, and therefore we depolarize the membrane. That thus increases the activity of these pH sensitive cells, whether they be astrocytes in the medulla or glomus cells out there in the carotid bodies. That depolarization causes these pH sensitive cells to spit out a neurotransmitter, in this case ATP. Okay, carbon dioxide built up, we have an increase in acid. that blocks my potassium channels, so I've depolarized, and now I start spitting out neurotransmitters, ATP in this case. That will then bind to purinergic receptors on the ninth cranial nerve in the carotid bodies. There is some chemo uh, receptors in the aortic arch as well, but to make things clean we'll just Call it good old cranial nerve 9 here. 
ATP binds much more readily when there's a drop in pH. So a drop in pH is doing two things, stimulating neurotransmitter release and facilitating its binding to these purinergic receptors, P2X2 receptors. These are just cation channels. So when ATP binds, positive charge flows in, and we depolarize, it's already over here, our cranial nerves. So we detect a drop in pH, which tells us we're building up too much carbon dioxide. It's probably time to breathe. Input from those chemoreceptors, whether they be in the medulla or out there on cranial nerves, arrives at the dorsal respiratory group. This is in the nucleus of the solitary tract. Remember, that's the sensory nucleus. Solitary. Sensory. So, uh, let's see, there's a cerebellum that we don't really care about, so I'm going to kind of truncate that. That'll be sitting over here in front of the pons. Medulla, spinal cord, something kind of like that. Midbrain, we don't really care about. So the input is going to be down here in the medulla. Here's my nucleus of the solitary tract. we got cranial nerves 9 and 10 providing input, blood gas, and lung stretch. Cranial nerve 10 will give us an idea of lung stretch. we got some input telling us kind of what's going on with our blood, what's going on with our lungs. And that will get us in our dorsal respiratory group. And I'll just put a... dorsal respiratory group. So that's my input. From here, I'm going to then go talk to a whole bunch of things, both excitatory and inhibitory projections going on here. So I'm going to go to this ventral respiratory column, which there are several components of. We'll get to in just a little bit, but from here, I'm just going to put kind of a circle here because it's neither excitatory nor inhibitory exclusively. It's a combination. Based on what's going on in the dorsal root ganglion, um, what's wrong with me? Dorsal respiratory group, I'm going to either excite some parts or inhibit them. It depends, and we'll look at, the, look at that in just a little bit. The other target is going to be the pontine respiratory group. So we've got we to head on up to the pons. affect this. The pontine respiratory group is the manager. This is going to make sure we don't try to inhale while we're doing something that's incompatible with that, like taking a drink. On occasion, you've probably inhaled a little bit while you're drinking. It doesn't work out very well. The pontine respiratory group helps prevent that. So this has input from the cortex, so we know what's going on what we want to do, for example. And this is going to have widespread modulatory input to the uh, ventral respiratory column. So that's this thing over here. Ventral respiratory column. Okay, we got input to the dorsal respiratory group. And then it talks to everything else to tell it what's going on out there in the body. All right, that uh, ventral respiratory column, we can cut up into a couple of different parts. Starting down here on the bottom, we have our respiratory groups. Not the dorsal respiratory group, but the ventral respiratory groups. There's the rostral, ventral respiratory group, and a caudal ventral respiratory group. Rostrals, of course, rostral and the caudal one. So two groups here. These talk to lower motor neurons. 
rostral ventral respiratory group causes us to inhale. Caudal ventral respiratory group is active when we exhale. So we can breathe in and breathe out. Two different groups there. They of course inhibit each other. Draw one there to keep it simple. They'll excite different lower motor neurons. For example, rostral ventral respiratory group. They'll stimulate lower motor neurons that will cause inhalation via the phrenic nerve. Caudal ventral respiratory group. For the most part, what this is going to do is inhibit the, vent the rostral ventral respiratory group so we don't inhale. And if we just let tone return to normal in our muscles, the pressure in our lungs will just allow air to passively escape. The caudal ventral respiratory group, if excited enough, will stimulate lower motor neurons to cause forceful exhalation. But that's only under periods where we're exercising or using a whole lot more oxygen and producing much more carbon dioxide than normal. Normally it's inhale and then allow the gas to leave. No need to forcefully exhale. The rest of this ventral respiratory column contains two important pacemakers. The Betzinger and pre-Betzinger complexes. This one has a nice fun little umlaut over the O. Betzinger, pre-Betzinger. Betzinger, active during exhalation. Pre-Betzinger, inhalation. So, not surprisingly, the pre-Betzinger complex will stimulate that rostral ventral respiratory group, so we inhale. Of course, it also inhibits the Betzinger group. These are pacemakers, only one will be active. The Betzinger group, of course, inhibits the pre-Betzinger and inhibits the rostral ventral respiratory group, so we don't inhale. If we have forceful exhalation, that's because the Betzinger complex excites the caudal ventral respiratory group. So it really depends on how much we need to get rid of that gas. If we want it to escape passively, which is most of the time, all we need to do is inhibit our inspiratory neurons in the, rest, in the rostral ventral respiratory group. In doing so, we'll stop inhaling and the gas will find its way out. That pontine respiratory group, as explained on this slide, is uh, going to determine whether it's appropriate to inhale or not. So if we're talking and we want to finish our thought, even though we might want to take a breath, we go ahead and finish the thought and then we breathe. And the pontine respiratory group lets us do that. So if we're talking, eating, drinking, that's going to control, of course, how we move air around. And we can think about three different phases of respiration, and that's what's shown over here in this illustration. The yellow inspiration. Notice which neurons are active. Pre-Betzinger complex and the rostral ventral respiratory group. Pre-Betzinger is active to turn on the rostral ventral respiratory group. If it's active, it stimulates lower motor neurons that allow us to inhale. After that yellow phase, we enter the post-inspiratory phase, where we're not inhaling and we're not inhaling. We inhale and just hold the air in. Then we allow it to leak out in the expiratory phase. The post-inspiratory phase is uh, facilitated by activity of the vagus, which is going to uh, prevent air from leaking out the airway, so it'll increase tone in the uh, in the uh, throat there to prevent air from leaking out. That is uh, facilitated by the Betzinger complex, 
A little later on, after we inhale, we enter the expiratory phase, where different neurons in the Betzinger complex then inhibit the rostral ventral respiratory group, allowing us to leak out the air. If we need to forcefully exhale it, the Betzinger complex recruits the caudal ventral respiratory group. So, a few groups here. Dorsal respiratory group, think of that as the input. What's going on with my gas and my lungs. If I'm low on oxygen and my lungs aren't full, we will stimulate the pre-Betzinger complex and the rostral ventral respiratory group. If the lungs are full already, first forcefully exhale, so stimulate Betzinger and caudal ventral respiratory, then pre-Betzinger and rostral ventral respiratory group. The actual output comes from these ventral respiratory groups. Rostral for inhalation, caudal for exhalation. And the timing of the switch between inhalation and exhalation is controlled by the Betzinger and pre-Betzinger complex. If we breathe slowly or rapidly, that's determined by the rate at which these two pacemakers switch back and forth. Betzinger and pre-Betzinger inhibit one another, so it's this back and forth. Betzinger, exhale. Pre-Betzinger, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. And they accomplish that through the ventral respiratory groups. And this allows us to maintain a relatively stable level of carbon dioxide in our blood. We also maintain a relatively stable pressure in our blood using the baroreflex. Similar, we're using both cranial nerves 9 and 10, but rather than uh, looking for a change in blood gas by monitoring pH, we're looking at a change in blood pressure by monitoring the stretch in either the carotid or the aorta for cranial nerves 9 and 10, respectively. Baroreceptors are just good old stretch receptors. If there is stretch that physically pulls open ion channels to directly depolarize cranial nerves 9 and 10, we're again going to the solitary tract nucleus. Now, you know what? I don't think I need to draw this. It's illustrated well over there. So, if there's an increase in blood pressure, there's an increase in stretch, cranial nerves 9 and 10 are more active. So they stimulate the nucleus of the solitary tract, particularly in the baroreceptor nucleus. From here, the baroreceptor nucleus, if active, stimulates parasympathetic preganglionic neurons in the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, DMX. Those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons then stimulate postganglionic parasympathetic neurons in the heart, causing a slowing of heart rate and thus a decrease in blood pressure. The nucleus of the solitary tract also projects to the vasomotor depressor center, that is the caudal ventral lateral medulla. Neurons in the caudal ventral lateral medulla inhibit neurons in the rostral ventral lateral medulla, otherwise known as the pressor center. This prevents sympathetic activation. So if there's an increase in blood pressure, two things happen. Increase parasympathetic output by stimulating the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Decrease sympathetic tone by inhibiting the rostral ventral lateral medulla. Those neurons no longer excite the uh, preganglionic sympathetic neurons in the spinal cord, and so sympathetic tone decreases. Again, heart rate drops. If blood pressure decreases, the nucleus of the solitary tract is not as active, we don't have as much parasympathetic output, and we also don't inhibit sympathetic tone as much. Thus, we get a net increase in sympathetic input to the heart, heart rate increases, and blood pressure increases accordingly. Moving on up, we have the circuits of 
sleep-wake cycles. The hypothalamus contains our, uh, our internal clock that controls the ascending arousal system located in the rostral reticular formation. The ascending arousal system contains a mix of neurons. These do two related things. The cholinergic neurons inhibit inhibitory neurons in the thalamus. As such, that disinhibits communication between the thalamus and the cortex. And this communication right here, this constant back and forth, is our consciousness. We are aware of sensory stimuli because they move into the thalamus and eventually reach the cortex. If they don't reach the cortex, we're not aware. By turning off inhibitory neurons, this allows sensory information to make it to the cortex. When we're asleep, no more inhibition. Inhibitory neurons prevent the thalamus from communicating to the cortex, so we don't see or hear stuff anymore. We just go to sleep. That's the cholinergic neurons. The monoaminergic neurons found in the brainstem and the hypothalamus project to the cortex providing direct excitation. So notice both of these increase activity in the cortex. Cholinergic neurons do it by disinhibiting the thalamus. Monoaminergic neurons do it by projecting to the cortex. So this is my ascending arousal system or my ascending reticular activating system, whatever you want to call it. I also have neurons in the hypothalamus in the tuberomammillary nucleus that release histamine and the lateral hypothalamus that release orexin. Orexin uh, is an excitatory neurotransmitter that's going to provide excitation to the cortex. So is histamine. Here we can see the effect of histamine on a neuron in the substantia nigra. Uh, if you look at panel B there, pretty easy to see. They apply histamine around 10 minutes in and the firing rate, shown on the y-axis, increases accordingly. When they inhibit histamine receptors with a histamine 1 receptor blocker, the firing rate goes back to normal. So histamine helps wake us up. Control of the ascending arousal system comes from the hypothalamus. We could have covered this in lecture 12, but we saved it for here. <clears throat> the nucleus that we care about in this case is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is located just above the optic chiasm. That's why it's named the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So that makes sense. And it's also a very convenient location for it because it gets input from our eyes. So some of the axons that are moving in the um, optic nerve there, when they cross the optic chiasm, project upward to the hypothalamus, targeting the suprachiasmatic nucleus. These are created by retinal ganglion cells that directly sense light. So similar to the retinal ganglion cells, they create the pupillary light reflex. Here, we're entraining circadian rhythms. So the central nucleus here is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This exhibits changes in activity throughout the day. Let's see if this is anything. Oh, that's much better. So we'll have periods of high activity and periods of low activity. Day, night. During the day, the SCN is very active. During the night, relatively quiet. It does this all on its own. It has some um, cyclic patterns of gene expression that increase excitability of SCN neurons during the day and decrease it during the night. Nifty stuff, but it's got its own internal molecular clock. 
We can train this though with light input. So there's the retinohypothalamic tract. Retinohypothalamic tract. Going from the retina to the hypothalamus. So when it's light, we turn on our suprachiasmatic nucleus. Those neurons in the retinohypothalamic tract are most sensitive to blue light. This is why night mode on electronic devices makes your screen look yellow. If you subtract blue from white, you get yellow. I know that might seem weird, but that's how light works, not pigments. So by providing less blue light, you can look at your screen at night, and it won't throw your circadian rhythms off quite as much. You could also just go to bed, but I'm sure you'd rather stay up studying for my class. I appreciate that. Just turn on night mode. So we'll have periods where the SCN is more active and less active. When it's more active, it talks to its partners. This inhibits the subparaventricular zone. Who cares what the name is? This is the thing that normally inhibits uh, the dorsomedial hypothalamus. So if the SCN is active, let's go ahead and make it active, let's pretend it's daytime. My subparaventricular zone is not as active, so it doesn't inhibit the dorsal medial hypothalamus. So this thing is on. Cool. The dorsal medial hypothalamus is going to do a couple of things for us. It's going to inhibit the ventral lateral preoptic area. This is our sleep center. So we're not asleep. Cool. But are we awake yet? Not yet. We gotta go to the lateral hypothalamus. So the lateral nucleus here. Turn that bad boy on. That's what contains the orexinergic neurons. The orexinergic neurons in the lateral hypothalamus then turn on their targets, which are twofold. The ascending reticular activating system, those cholinergic and monoaminergic neurons that we just went through, and it also, of course, projects directly to the cortex to turn it on. So we're awake. By inhibiting the VLPO, that prevents it from inhibiting the ascending arousal system. But notice, we've got this nice little reciprocal inhibition. We're either awake or we're asleep. <clears throat> what we can see over here is activity. Um, in, well, output from the hypothalamus, giving us these circadian releases of vasopressin. You can see on the left, this is in normal intact rats. You'll get these peaks and valleys of hormone release if you remove the suprachiasmatic nucleus, as they did on the right. No more peaks and valleys. It's either a flat line or kind of like a, just a mountain ridge. So circadian rhythms are lost. In case you prefer a colorful cartoon, here's what I've already given you up here. It shows you what's going on in subjective day. That is, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is active in part B there. Notice the lateral hypothalamus is active, promoting wakefulness. At night, the SCN is less active, so the subparaventricular zone inhibits the dorsal medial hypothalamus which disinhibits the VLPO, making it active. The VLPO then inhibits the lateral hypothalamus and the ascending reticular activating system, giving us a nice switch. This is showing us the effect of orexin on components of that ascending reticular activating system. Uh, for example, neurons in the tuberomammillary nucleus that release histamine throughout the cortex.
These neurons are stimulated by orexin. We can see the raw recording in panel A. And we can also see a summary of applications of the orexin peptide to millivolts of depolarization in panel C. In other words, orexin causes depolarization. It does so by GQ-coupled receptors, so we get long-lived excitation. Notice in panel A, even after that, uh, orexin is no longer applied, as shown by the black bar, the neuron maintains a high level of firing because we're dealing with metabotropic receptors. That reciprocal inhibition creates a nice winner-take-all system, as we see in many parts of the central nervous system. We are either awake or we are asleep, and it's a fairly rapid transition between the two. That's because of this reciprocal inhibition. When one is active, if the sleep circuitry is active, it turns off. Um, if the, I'm sorry, if the wakefulness circuitry is active, it turns off the sleep circuitry. On the other hand, if my sleep circuit is active, it turns off the wake circuitry. So only one can be active at a time. And those neurons in the ventral lateral preoptic area are what are responsible for our loss of consciousness, not only during sleep, but also with anesthetics. Here we see the effect of isoflurane on the firing of neurons in the ventral lateral preoptic area. Look in panel D. Iso is isoflurane. This causes rapid loss of consciousness at the correct doses. Where they have the blue bar, they've applied isoflurane, and notice neurons in the ventral lateral preoptic area become active. Activation of ventral lateral preoptic neurons causes inhibition of my wake promoting neurons, and thus I get loss of consciousness. Once we lose our consciousness, we pass through sleep, of which there are uh, several stages. We have slow wave sleep, that is stages three, four, something like that. And then we have REM sleep, where we have high frequency brain waves that resemble what we find during wakefulness. What they're showing you over here are EEG recordings. So surface electrodes record electrical activity in the brain through the meninges, scalp, skull, hair. So you get very small deflections. During wakefulness, because there's a whole lot of activity going on in our cortex, um, neurons are often not active synchronously because we're performing calculations. So you get very small deflections. When we sleep, and the cortex becomes a little less active so that there's um, when there is activity it tends to be in a coordinated manner you get these larger deflections so it might surprise you the larger the deflection that means there's less activity but if neurons are chitter chattering back and forth you don't get these peaks and valleys it's a relatively constant stream of chitter chatter that's what wakefulness and REM sleep looks like. As we go through the night, we cycle in and out of slow wave and REM sleep. We tend to see more slow wave sleep early on and a little more REM sleep later. Now what causes this switch from REM to non-REM sleep are neurons in the pons. Pontine neurons, either called REM off or REM on, promote REM or inhibit it. REM off neurons prevent REM sleep by inhibiting REM on neurons. Just that simple. If REM off neurons are active, we're in slow wave sleep. As we transition into REM sleep, REM off neurons are no longer active, so REM on neurons turn on. There's a collection of different REM on neurons and they're going to project to different areas and do different things. Some of my REM-on neurons project upward. 
from the pons to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and eventually to the occipital lobes from there. This creates dreams. This creates the visions that we see during our dreams. So, part of my REM on neurons project out to the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and neurons there project to the primary visual cortex. So, I see stuff. I dream. That's that pontine geniculo occipital wave. There's rim off, just so we, for completeness sake, you know. These rim on neurons also project to gaze centers, like the paramedian pontine reticular formation, or the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. That's why we have rapid eye movements. So projections to the thalamus create the dreams, projections to the gaze centers create the eye movements. We also, of course, inhibit REM off neurons. And the last thing that we have to do is make sure we don't act out our dreams. It's great to follow your dreams when you're awake, but when you're asleep, don't act them out, especially if you share the bed with somebody. We need to create sleep atonia. So we're going to project downward into the medulla and target inhibitory neurons. Glycinergic neurons down here that will then inhibit lower motor neurons. So in case there's a bear chasing us or something like that in our dreams, we don't start running from it. We have sleep atonia because REM on neurons do three things. Make us dream, give us rapid eye movements via gaze centers, and create sleep atonia through those inhibitory glycinergic neurons in the medulla. That about does it for our reticular formation. If anything isn't clear, let me know in the questions box, and we'll talk about it in class. See you later.